for me, safety wire. Um, we're very glad that you decided to join us tonight. And we hope that you're going to gain some understanding and new knowledge about safety wire and safety items as relates to your aircraft. Um, tonight we have with us, uh, like Steve said just a minute ago, let's see, uh, we've got uh, John Wood in the back picture over here. John, would you like to say hi to, to everyone? Sure, I would. Thanks, Rob. And welcome aboard to everybody tonight. It's a great seminar. I think you're going to get some really good, useful information. And I'm saying hi to you from the foggy and chilly coast of Maine, where it's about 60 degrees right now. I hope it's warmer where you are. Great to have you with us. Welcome. And the, and the next mug shot here uh, is uh, Steve Brown, who was just talking to us. Steve, would you again introduce yourself to everybody, please? Hello, everyone. I'll talk to you again a little bit later on tonight. Yeah. And Dan is my uh, partner down here in, uh, in Connecticut. Dan, uh, would you say hi to everybody, please? Hello, everyone. Hello from uh, Windsor, Connecticut. Happy to be here tonight. I just saw the presentation, and uh, it was some interesting stuff about safety wire that I didn't know. Happy to be here. And this old geezer over here is me. And uh, I've got a picture of Tim. Tim Haley from Greensboro, North Carolina. As I mentioned, or was mentioned earlier, Tim is an AMP mechanic um, and might even be an IA. Tim, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Hey, Robert. Thanks for letting me uh, join in tonight. Yeah, my name is Tim Haley. I am an IA and AMP. Great. Uh, so appreciate you letting me hang out with you guys tonight. Well, we appreciate you being on board with us. Just in case I get into some deep water, you can, uh, I'll reach up my hand, you can pull me up. But I appreciate you being here with us, Tim. Okay, so tonight, safety wire. Um, it is a good thing. Safety wire is a good thing, as you can see, uh, where this rod end had broke due to corrosion. And the safety wire held this aileron cable together and, uh, and made it so that, uh, you know, an accident didn't occur. Um, so the bottom line is on top of, of all these locking devices you've got whether they're b nuts or or bolts with holes drilled in them or or turnbuckles or elastic nuts they all have safety devices um, um if you if you're used to seeing a piece of hardware with a locking device and, and you notice that the locking device is missing don't be afraid to ask the question it could it, it really could save your life so here we got a picture of an accident that occurred in katy texas um, this occurred on may 27th in 2018 where a cirrus sr20 airplane crashed shortly after takeoff the pilot reported that he could not maintain roll control of the airplane the air, airplane began to roll to the left and the pilot was able to counteract with right aileron input initially, but the airplane continued to roll to the left. Uh, the, the pilot continued to use right aileron and trim, lowered the nose, and executed a straight and forced landing just beyond the departure into the runway. The pilot survived with minor injuries. And here we have a depiction of what took place. Um, this bolt right here which is to be secured with safety wire in this assembly, we actually had worked its way out and released this aileron control arm and it caused, it rendered the ailerons um, so that they didn't function and, and that's why he lost the control. Um, and here you can see a picture, you can actually visually inspect this on the, on the Cirrus from underneath um, on a walk around and we recommend that all uh, service owners visually verify the, you know, the presence of the safety wire. Um, if safety wire isn't present, you know, talk to your mechanic um, your ma or your certified maintenance provider and have that corrected before your next flight. So um, as you look at this picture here, is there anything that looks odd to you? Is there anything that you, you pick up? Um, maybe this, this gap here or um, possibly something funky about these nuts that you see here at the end. Um, and, and the reality is that uh, the airplane uh, took a test flight 
with the brake caliper and hub just finger tight. You see the gap between the cylinder and the brake backing plate. And here's an amplified picture of the uh, of the bolt head, and you can see the hole. You can see the hole here that that should have safety wire in it. And obviously, that was the task wasn't completed properly, and safety wire was not installed. And I'm going to go to the next slide, and and Steve, I'm going to ask you to jump in here. Yeah. You know, in doing the maintenance on the aircraft, really, this is one of the things to think about. Um, we'll talk about preventive maintenance later on, but doing the job right for a mechanic does take some time. And even associated with something as simple as safety wiring, it may take a little bit more time than you realize. Uh, the reason why is many times mechanics actually have to create the hole in the appropriate nut or bolt and they have to have the right tool for the job. The first one you see over on the left is what they would use to put a hole in the corner of the nut or in the corner of a bolt head. And a tool like you see in the middle is what they would use if they were gonna be using, say, a castellated nut uh, on that bolt at some point. And it, it does take a little bit of time. You know, if you've ever drilled through metal and have to do it multiple times, like you know, replacing brakes on an aircraft or with an upgrade or something like that. And also, you know, if you're doing preventive maintenance along with your mechanic is making sure you're doing the job right with the right tools. You know, I put the picture over here to the right of somebody giving an example of drilling a hole through a bolt head, which I suspect they're going to lose their fingers in just a little bit <laughs> with the way that it works. <laughs> and that's why, whether it's your mechanic or you, you need to make sure that you do have the right tool for the job. And there are some specialty type tools that are associated with what we're talking about tonight. Thank you, Steve. And again, um, you know, if it's, if it's got, if the bolt's got a hole, it should have safety wire in it. Um, there could be a good reason, you know, if, um, that for instance, that, that wasn't safety wire. Could it, could it be that the mechanic ran out of safety wire or, was waiting on parts, or maybe the mechanic just failed to complete the test because they were pulled off and failed to go back and complete the job. That's why it's so important to pre-flight and do a thorough detailed look at your aircraft, especially after maintenance has been performed. Do not be afraid to question your mechanic um, about something that you observe. They would be nothing but extremely, extremely grateful if you found something they missed. And most importantly, your life and other lives may depend upon it. So has anybody heard of the um, Dirty Dozen? It's talking about uh, the 12 common causes of human factors errors. About 80% of maintenance mistakes involve human factors. And if not detected, they, they can lead to accidents. So I want to talk to you about just a few, just three of those um, items. First one is, and number one is distractions. Um, this is something that we all face, but mechanics face this too. And anything that draws the attention away from the task at hand. And, and distractions are the number one cause of forgetting things, including what has or has not been done in a maintenance task. task. The best remedy is for the mechanic to use a checklist. It's a good idea to, to know that your mechanic uses a checklist for this task because it's a safety valve for you to make sure he hasn't forgotten something, forgotten to do something. Just as, as pilots um, always felt very comforted when going flying and I saw the pilot using the checklist versus a guy who was just flying uh, from memory. Um, so, so, so the second um, one I want to talk about is fatigue, um, physical or mental exhaustion threatening work performance. And the best remedy um, for that is, because uh, everybody faces that from time to time, is to have others double check the work when experiencing fatigue. And thirdly is pressure. Um, real or perceived forces demanding high, high level job performance. And the best remedy is safety first. They must have the time to do the job right. You know, sometimes things just don't go as planned. 
especially with aviation maintenance. You know, parts don't fit or work right, and there's pressures that uh, that that can be added in there if if there's a planned trip that you have for your aircraft or um, or something that you feel pressured. And if you add pressure to the mechanic, not that he doesn't want to do the job right, um, but that may be a contributing factor for him possibly missing something. So it's really important to communicate with your mechanic. Don't assume everything is going well and find out what they're dealing with if they are and have regular open discussions. Lastly, um, the link here takes you to the Dirty Dozen document. I suggest you take a screenshot and make the time to review the Dirty Dozen document. Um, it's, it's, it's full of things that are mishap laden and things that cause problems as relates to mechanics and some of this stuff also applies to you as pilots or if you're performing maintenance and it just will make you better aware of what what your mechanics are up against so i, I know this really sounds a little condescending but um to start here but but m most mechanics say this inside their head several times a day but never out loud right Righty tighty, lefty loosey. Um, do you see the key reason um, the person safety wired the oil filter should have asked themselves this question? Do you see something wrong with the, the way that this is installed? The safety wire on this assembly here on this oil filter. What what is wrong with this? The problem is is that it's installed backwards. It's installed lefty loosey, so. This is actually causing it to twist in an unturn or to unscrew itself, which is the opposite of what safety wire is supposed to do. It should be wrapped around this side of this oil filter and causing it to stay tight. So let's talk about some basics um, with safety wire. Again, applying the principle of lefty, loosey and righty tighty, you see how the, the this is wrapped this way around this way, which caused that bolt to, to screw in tighter um, and not the opposite way looser. And then if you look that the tension here to the other bolt is, is again applying pressure this way. And then finally on this last bolt, you'll see that again, the tension again is, is in, a, in is a right hand or righty tighty fashion. On this next slide, we got two oil filters. After our last dis discussion a couple of slides ago, you should know which one is the right one and which is the wrong one. Um, obviously, the one that's white is right, and the, the one that's red is wrong here. Uh, again, you look at the, the, the righty tighty here, the, the safety wire is pulling that so that that oil filter would be tightened by this safety wire, and just the opposite is here. Um, on this. So next we're going to take a look at some more basics with safety wire. Um, according to AC 4313-1B, which, um, which has been added as an, as an attachment here. Or, or Steve, what is it called? Again, it's not an attachment. What is it called that, that's included that, that, that you included earlier today for everybody to download? Yeah, the handouts. And we have a Yes, and we have advisory circular 4313.1b um, is available. What we're talking about today comes out of Chapter 7, Section 7 on safety. But if you ever do preventive maintenance or you have an experimental aircraft or whatever, terrific document. It's a must-have in your library. All right, sort of the maintenance Bible for mechanics and pilots to perform maintenance. Um, preventative maintenance on the aircraft. But anyway, it, it details that for each inch, generally speaking, you should have six to eight twists per inch, okay? Um, as you can see, this this oil filter with the safety wire is, is keeping in line with that, that requirement. Whereas this one down here, see how loosely twisted it is? This is the wrong wrong way to do it. So, there's no excuse for bad safety wire. Nothing says like, I don't care, like a safety wire such as this, where you've got um, no righty tighty here, you've got um, 
instead of the wire being wrapped around the bolt here. Um, hey, hey, Tim, are, are you online? Could you talk a little bit um, in more detail about what is really wrong with these, uh, um, the safety wire on these bolts here? Well, I think it'd in? probably be simpler for me to point out what's right about the whole job because I, I don't think there's one set of bolts on there that's correct. Starting at mm -hmm. the 12 o'clock position, first off, going across the top of the bolt like that, uh, you know, that's not really pulling it left or pulling it right. It's just kind of anchoring it there. Now, it is going into the next bolt at the 2 o'clock position. That That's not even pulling that bolt. I mean, you could say it's pulling it tighter because it's coming down to about the nine o'clock position and in theory it would be pulling it up, but that's just not a proper way to do it. Uh, the safety wire should be going around the outside of the bolt and coming to this side, not coming across the top of the bolt. It's not really putting a pull on it like that. Uh, down to four o'clock position, I think same thing. You don't come across the top. I mean, it is pulling that bolt tighter, but it's putting a neutral pull on the next bolt down at the six o'clock position. So, I mean, there's not really much about that safety wire job. And I think that what you've typed in here is a good example. You know, a mechanics usually take pride in their safety wire jobs. And, you know, you can tell right to here, this guy doing a safety wire job really just doesn't care about the job he's doing. Right, no pride in the work in, on this picture for sure. Thank you, thank you, Tim, for jumping in there. Uh, the no next, problem. Appreciate it. This next uh, slide uh, was thrown in there just for fun. I'll bring up, you know, some things to think about on the type of flying that you do is you may need to see some other types of safety wire on it. If you fly aerobatic aircraft quite often, you'll find emergency um release handles you know where canopies can be released doors can be released or whatever and those levers so that they're not inadvertently activated do need to be safety wired but they usually are done with like a thinner metal brass style type of safety wire so that it can be broken uh if that emergency handle needs to be used it's almost like a safety cover you might find on an airline based one. And here's an example of where you might end up seeing that, you know, in the pigtail tucked behind so that people don't scratch themselves on it. And on the next slide, we'll take a look at an aircraft where you really need to be Hulk Hogan uh, <laughs> to release this. Is this particular type of aircraft has a large lever that goes across the canopy um, to release and somebody put the steel safety wire on it uh, you know, that's probably the, what, 0 0.40 safety wire by the looks of it, really thick stuff that needs a lot of strength. And, you know, most people, even without that twisted, without the strength that the twist gives to it, probably would not be able to um, pull that handle across and break that safety wire. And that's something to think about because it's interesting. I, I've gone out with... Uh, since I deal in the aerobatic world a little bit, I've gone out with some mechanics and, you know, looking for brass type safety wire. And I find a lot of mechanics that just go, oh, I'll just put, you know, that <laughs> regular safety wire on it. Uh, no, that, that's not going to be a good thing if it ever was needed. And here's another example. This is a, I used to operate a fleet of aircraft like this and sometimes safety wire and just something really simple safety wire can be a money saver for you. You know, this is a French aerobatic aircraft, which basically what that means to most people is expensive <laughs> part <laughs> in relation to it. We had a circumstance, you know, where the thing you never really think about happened to us, and it even had an implication to safety, what we would call an occurrence within the FAA is we had two instructors out training, one instructor training another, uh, more junior instructor to be able to start teaching in this aircraft. And the fire extinguisher located behind them, the safety latch came undone while they were inverted. Well, the fire extinguisher de decided to not only depart the holder, but decided to depart the aircraft through the middle of the canopy and broke a hole right in the canopy and disappeared. And, you know, 
this is now 20 years ago too, uh, you know, $3,500 plus canopy that had to get specially made and shipped over from Europe and everything else. You know, we had a mechanic that had a terrific idea, said, why don't we just right on the latch of the fire extinguisher, put on the same type of brass safety wire that we do on the emergency canopy handle on this aircraft. That way, you know, the lever can't be picked up unless you purposely want to. And it was a great idea that we ended up applying to all of our aircraft so that they didn't we didn't have fire extinguishers flopping around everywhere on them. Many of you are kind of curious, but this is just what a basic safety wiring kit um, looks like. This is from Aircraft Spruce. This is my own personal one, uh, as you take a look. It comes with a couple of the basic tools, just like an economy set of pliers. It also has a hand twister, which makes it easier if you're doing it by hand and works great on the thinner safety wire. Also in this particular kit, you get a few different um, thicknesses of safety wire that are to be used on different things. You can see uh, the sizes associated with them and everything. And because you can do safety wiring with maintenance, even the box for the um, safety wire pliers has some directions, not only how to use them, which is a lot of people you don't would not know, but how to get yourself set up if you are replacing some safety wire in some certain places. It is important, though, that you do know how to use the tools and know how to use them right. And Dan, I'm going to reach out to you. We were talking about this earlier, is uh, you've worked on your own aircraft preventive maintenance, but safety wire, what, you were saying it was an art form, not? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, when I was a much younger man in my 20s, my first airplane was a uh, 1946 Cessna 120. And to save money, um, I was pretty poor back then. To save money, I would um, assist my IA for the uh, annual inspection, and he only charged me, you know, like 25% extra to let me help him. <laughs> um, That's but, all. Wow. <laughs> uh, but no, it was great. I got to learn a lot about safety work, and he taught me how to do the. Uh, by doing that, he taught me how to do the. I had one of those uh, El Reno um, STC spin-on oil filter kits for it. And so he taught mm -hmm. me how to safety wire the um, the oil filter and, of course, the uh, the oil plug at the bottom. And I, th I think the thing that really shocked me was, you know, he could just take those pliers and just spin it real quick and it would be – everything would be snug. It would be twisted right and everything would be righty-tighty. And, I mean, he just made it look so easy. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to go do this on my next oil change. And um, I ended up having to – you know, call him and he came back out and showed me again because it took some practice. I didn't realize it's it's such an art form. Um, and, and it's um, I, I see what the, what you're talking about with them. It's kind of like a, a mark of pride for a mechanic. And um, at the end, I got pretty good with it. But uh, yeah, I I, uh, I bled a few times and learned how to do the curly cue at the at, at the end where it's tucked in where it doesn't scratch you. And um, but yeah, it's it's definitely a bit of a bit of an art form. I have a I have a real appreciation for it now when I see uh, stuff that's really nice and safety wired. <laughs> yeah, and you know, for many pilots, they don't necessarily know what it even how safety wire pliers work. So if we move on to the next slide, um, you can take a look. Or oh, excuse me, I'm one ahead of myself. It is yes. important, and this is uh, one of the things that if you wanted to get nitpicky about that prop bolt <laughs> that we were looking at, but Safety wires, most safety wire pliers are set up for the most common type of bolt, you know, the classic righty tighty lefty loosey. But like, say, propane tanks or something you may see around your house, occasionally you will have bolts that are threaded in the opposite direction. And with those, it is highly encouraged and recommended that you might end up in some circumstances where instead of the crossover, of the safety wire going in a clockwise direction, you might need it actually going in a counterclockwise direction. So better safety wire pliers than just the typical economy style ones have the ability to change directions like this 
so that you have the ability. Also, you do see some mechanics, believe it or not, they have right-hand turning ones and they have left-hand turning safety wire pliers too. So it, it does depend upon that, but that's something to take a look at or to be thinking about if you ever get involved in the preventive maintenance side of these things. Hey, Robert, and, do you mind if I jump in? I'm sorry, Steve, no, I didn't please, mean to step on you. Please, Tim. Thank you. Uh, you know, while you're talking about safety wire pliers, um, some of the, you'll see some safety wire pliers and you, we look at the jaws, you'll notice that somebody has uh, made them smooth, have ground out or sanded out and made the pliers be smooth. The issue there is the way some of the safety wire pliers are designed, when they crimp the wire, they will scratch and kink the wire. So, you know, in theory, if you've got a pair of safety wire pliers like that, you should only be using it on the wire that's going to be cut and removed. So you'll see guys that will sand down the jaws of the safety wire pliers, get them smooth so they don't damage the wire. That way they can use it uh, on the whole length of the wire and not just on the pigtail. Mm -hmm. Wow, good point, good point. Yeah. So, this, so they can start, if it's a real long run, so to speak, they could start midway and do the wrap and then move it back, move the pliers back in the wire. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Not damage the wire as you're, as you're uh, clamping the pliers down on it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. That's interesting. I never knew that. Um, the next slide, um, uh, Steve, you put up here about how they work. Did, did you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, just, uh, you know, for a lot of the pilot types, you know, that are not involved with it, they may not know or understand how safety wires work in relation to it is they're like kind of a regular set of pliers you know with the ridged grooves up at the top like tim was just talking about and many of them have a beveled edge uh, to allow you to get in closer to where you're doing the twisting action along with uh, some cutting teeth tim probably knows this much better than the rest of us many people that end up doing this you know will use a pair of wire cutters or something that work better than what's built into these pliers themselves. They may actually use a couple tools, but it has down in the lower portion a little catch or hook so that you can clamp onto the safety wire uh, in relation to it. And the little silver part that you see is actually the ability for you to move the catch lever if you do want to release it and everything and then you have the knob that pulls down that actually provides the twisting action that you can see so that gives you an idea of the functionality of safety wire pliers how they actually do function what they actually do end up doing very good thank you steve um we're going to look at some more safety um items uh, we're going to jump into this area called uh lock nuts so in this case this is a uh, a lock nut right here um, that's improperly installed on this uh, assembly um, does everybody see that the actual threaded portion that should be coming through here is not coming through it's um, just partially on here that's that's not a, not proper um, as you can see by this diagram here um, you've got a a locking portion of the nut right up here at the top of it and the installation should be where at least one thread is beyond the top of this nut um, actually ac 4313 talks about um, um, the chamfered edge or end of the bolt or stud must extend at least a full round or chamfer through the nut um, flat end bolts studs and screws should should extend at least one thirty-second of an inch through the nut. Um, uh, Tim, would you be able to elaborate a little bit more on that? Um, and just sort of add clarity to that for us. Uh, about, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. There's been two school of thoughts of that over the years. Because originally, I think in the forty-three thirteen, it talked about three threads coming through the right. locking portion of the nut, but then. Later on now, I think they just call for the chamfer of the bolt or 132nd to be coming through that. Yes. 
Uh, one yeah. more thing to bring up about self-locking nuts. Uh, pictured here are what's called uh, fiber lock nuts. You also have steel lock nuts. And you need to be aware of the environment that you're installing this nut. If you're putting a lock nut onto an exhaust system, then it can't be a fiber lock nut. You'll be surprised. You'll see guys will screw a fiber lock nut onto a component like that that's getting hot. You know, within the first few hours of operation, the heat has already melted the plastic out of there and the nuts lost its self-locking feature. So that's another key po point on installing lock nuts is to be sure you're installing the proper one in the area that you're working in. Oh, yeah. So they are temperature, um, you know, the, the environment is, is the important thing there. How about oil? Does oil affect, um, you know, a fiber um, lock nut? Um, Tim, I'm not aware of any of the. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, granted, maybe Skydrawl or that type of oil might have an effect on it. This is a nylon fiber lock nut, and I'm mm -hmm. not aware of any of the standard oils that's engine oil or or those kind of oils that would have any effect on that lock nut. But then, mm -hmm. like I said, in some of the uh, newer aircraft that might be using some kind of hydraulic fluid, might have some kind of effect on it. I'm not. I'm not really up on that. Okay. Well, that would be something in the um, aircraft maintenance manual for sure. It yeah, goes yeah. back to using the parts called out in the parts manual. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tim, for helping us out there. Um, the le next picture we're going to look at um, over here is a couple of set of nuts. Um, obviously, this is more in view because it's closer to the camera, and this was a little bit further away, but. Can you identify which of these nuts is the right one that's been installed? Um, as you can see down here, this is the, um, the lock nut. It just has a different rounded edge here, and this is just a plain nut. Um, and it, you should never have one that's not locking or not collared with a cutter pin um, in an aircraft. And obviously, this is... Uh, uh, this is this is wrong type of nut, and this is the right type of nut in this place. Okay. Um, next, we're going to go into a couple of accidents, and we're going to look at the root cause, causal effect of it. Um, this particular um, accident occurred um, in April 23rd of 2017. This is an experimental amateur-built World War One fighter replica, departed from a private airstrip for a local flight. The airplane climbed, turned left, and entered the downward leg for the runway. Shortly thereafter, the airplane descended into a steep, nose-down attitude, and it impacted the terrain. Signatures are the ground signature, is what we're talking about, the ground signature here, um, observed at the accident site, and the damage to the airplane were consistent with the near-vertical impact attitude into the terrain. What they found that in the post-accident examination was that the elevator flight control cable rod end had separated from its turnbuckle, which resulted in the pilot losing pitch control of the airplane. No safety wire was found at the connection of the turnbuckle and the separated cable rod end, even though it should have been safety wired according to proper maintenance procedures. It's likely that the connection just gradually, gradually worked itself loose and you can see it right here where it disconnected um, and caused loss of elevator control and the root cause of that accident. Next, we're going to take a look at turnbuckles. Um, as you can see in the picture on the left here, um, this is a couple of rod ends that are going into a turnbuckle. And you see these clips right here? These are called turnbuckle clips. This clip is uh, sort of a, I can't think you can see it on this picture a little bit better, but it actually has a, a piece that extends down through a slotted portion of the rod end, and the actual turnbuckle's got a slot where it fits in. And those have to be lined up before it gets inserted or you'll be able to insert it properly. And then the other end has got a little clip that slips down to the hole in the center of the turnbuckle. And um, you've got to make sure that it's all lined up right. These, these are some Sometimes, my experience was that sometimes they're very difficult to get in and seated properly. So if you see one of these clips extended out, up, and not seated all the way flush here, um, that's a sign that it's not put together right. So there's something that may, may have a problem with it. 
another possibility is that um, instead of it being centered like these two turnbuckles are, if one got started sooner than the other, this could have been skewed over and preventing those to go in. And then the other uh, pictures here, this is out of, again, AC 4313-1B, um, advisory circular. Um, and you can see all the different types of, of wraps um, with safety wire that, that, are, that are acceptable. And if you look into the AC, um, it also talks about the size of the cable and the size of the safety wire that you're using and which type of wrap is acceptable given the size of the cable and the size of the safety wire. Hey, Robert. This is, yes, go ahead. Do you mind if I jump in? Not there? at all. Absolutely, <clears throat> Tim. Okay. Um, so to explain, uh, to add to what Robert just said, uh, on the turnbuckle on the picture on the left, the top turnbuckle, you'll notice on the right side, there's a groove. <clears throat> that groove indicates that's the left-hand threads of that turnbuckle on that side. Uh, those clips, I've used those clips thousands of times. They work really good. But here in North Carolina, we've had two accidents in the last five years where the control cables have broken. And luckily in both of those airplanes, they were safety wired with example B on the right side of the example. And that safety wire, because the mechanics used the proper size safety wire, that's another thing is they call out for 40 thousandths uh, safety wire to be in there. That safety wire held that turnbuckle together until the pilots could get the airplane on the ground. So in that case, if we had used spring clips as illustrated on the left, when that turnbuckle broke, the cable would have went completely slack and he would have had absolutely no elevator control. So uh, old school and the safety wire is not a bad idea on control cables. That's a, that's a good point. Real good point, Tim. And this I, think you're getting ready to I think you're getting ready to show us a picture of that. Yes, it's exactly right. There you go. And, and this is a picture, um, like uh, Tim had pointed out, where the safety wire is actually holding the control cable together. Um, and the pilot was able to operate the airplane as if nothing had happened, and it was picked up in an inspection. Um, this particular aircraft is a, is a Beechcraft Bonanza. Um, the American Bonanza Society is aware of six recent cases of failure of the swaged in of flight control cables. That's this, this right here, okay, in beach piston airplanes. Four were in aileron control cables, one in an elevator control cable, and one in a rudder control cable. Two of these cases are currently still under investigation by the NTSB. Um, Failure of a control cable connection at the turnbuckle result in loss of use of associated control surfaces and probable loss of control of the aircraft. Um, in all these cases, the failure resulted from corrosion of the swaged end of the cable. Um, and the turnbuckles were loaded, located um, underneath heater ducts, um, which caused condensation or water to be dripping on them, okay? And that's what caused, caused it. The other um, elevator control and rudder control um, cables that had the, the rust were uh, caused by um, the overhead fresh air inlet duct up on top of above it. Um, so um, safety wire, like, like Tim said, is, is an extra um, safety uh, valve um, over the turnbuckle clips in, in situations such as this. So it's important that um, your mechanics obviously would be inspecting for that in an annual, but uh, that's one of the things that is, has been noted as of late. Um, next, we're going to look at uh, some other type of fasteners, um, and they're called castle nuts. See how it looks like a castle around here? It's got these slots in it. And in this case, you've got um, a cotter pin. Now, the cotter pin is going to come through here and go through a, a hole that's inside the bolt here. And that's what secures that, that, that in place. Next, we're gonna you know, look at fasteners that are other than bolts. Um, here we've got B-nuts and, and B-nuts have got little slots in them where the safety wire can be in, installed and then secured to another portion of the, in this case, you know, the fitting. 
but again, you can see how they're righty tighty um, in this case. And in some cases, you're you're bolting um, or safety wiring two together again using the good righty tighty practice. And uh, so we've got just some more examples here. Um, next, we're going to take a look at picture of a PA22150 in Thomason, Georgia. Uh, in this case, it's a Piper Twin Pacer experiencing an off airport landing and substantial damage due to the throttle cable coming loose. The castle nut that held the throttle arm right here um, to the carburetor was loose and did not have a cotter pin installed. According to the pilot, the airplane had returned to service um, after being restored by um, an airframe and power plant mechanic with, with an IA. The pilot performed several takeoffs and landings prior to the accident flight and noted that the airplane seemed to operate normally. The, the pilot then departed to another airport where he complete, completed a simulated instrument approach to about 50 feet above the runway. He then commenced to go around over the departure end of the runway with the airplane about 300 feet above the ground. The engine experienced a partial loss of power. The pilot maneuvered the airplane to a hayfield where he performed a forced landing. During the landing roll, a horizontal stab stabilizer st struck a hay bale resulting in substantial damage to the empennage. A post-accident examination of the wreckage by the FAA inspector revealed that the cotter pin was not installed on the throttle arm retaining nut, as, as is depicted right here, which is again an amplified picture of it right here. You can see the arm coming down here and it's attached to the actual throttle control arm right here. But this is what it loosened. And if you look closely in here, you can see that this is a knurled um, fixture here and it's, it's it, the castle nut is what holds that tight and holds that in place. Okay, um, Brother Steve, it's your turn to jump in on the local accident that occurred up in your district. Yeah, and you know, every year, no matter what district we're in, uh, whether it's Tim down in Greensboro, I up in Boston, John in Maine, whatever it may be, almost every year we have some accidents that are maintenance related or maintenance induced. And to show you that this is not just taking place in far off reaches of the country, but it does happen right at home. This is a local accident that we had that kind of deals with this whole subject. Uh, the pilot was very lucky. Actually, there's an airworthiness directive out on these aircraft for this particular problem uh, with this. And most people that have experienced this particular problem have died. Uh, this pilot experienced it on takeoff uh, where he got an extreme nose down pitch uh, he was able to basically drive the aircraft onto the end of the runway and ripped off the gear and everything. We hit so hard, but, you know, walked away from this particular accident that we had. This was in a Cessna 402B. If we move on to the next slide, we, we'll start to see. Uh, this is actually the trim. If you take a look on the left-hand side is the trim tab on the elevator. And at the accident site, we found that it was in stuck in a travel position of about 24 degrees up. And if I recall from the maintenance manual, the maximum limit of up travel uh, for that trim tab was five degrees up. How this all came about is this is looking down into the tail where the elevator connects to the horizontal stabilizer. And you can see the turnbuckle in the bolt is there should be a bolt there with a castellated nut and it should be checked and it should be checked for corrosion and everything. Uh, and this aircraft had just come out of the annual recently, not immediately before this accident, but recently. And this is what we found. That armature is the push rod out to the elevator trim. And it came off of its connector into the elevator itself and got stuck you can see the little witness marks got stuck right down in there we did find floating around in the elevator is this bolt we never ever did find any remnants of a cotter pin or remnants of a castellated nut 
But along the same lines, we've already had one or two people call out this on some of the other pictures. You know, for us within the FA, it makes us wonder, okay, if there's a reoccurring AD at every 100 hours to check that fitting, check that nut, check that the cotter pin is there, check for the corrosion on it, why is it that soon after it came out of inspection, it was loose like this and we found that corroded of a bolt uh, in there? It, it does make you wonder. This is a very, very lucky pilot uh, in relation to it because there, I know the original accident was out in Missouri with a Cessna 310 that led to the airworthiness directive, and that was a very horrific accident with it. So, you know, it has an impact on us as pilots. You know, if simple things that we can check in our pre flight or if we get to know our aircraft better, that really, really will help us out. And this is just one example of it that we dealt with in the New England area. Thank you, Steve. And here we're looking at a glasser in Yuma, Arizona. Um, happened in 2018. Uh, about 37 minutes into the flight, the pilot noticed that the engine manifold pressure was dropping along with the airplane's airspeed. Consistent with a partial loss of engine power. The engine then experienced total loss of power while he was maneuvering for an emergency landing to a nearby airport. The airplane subsequently landed short of the runway and sustained substantial damage to the aft fuselage. Uh, post accident examination, the engine revealed that the throttle linkage had detached from the throttle arm, right here, um, of the fuel injection servo. The rod and bearing for the linkage and the throttle arm were intact and undamaged, but the connecting bolt and its associated washers, castle nut, and cotter pin were missing. It is likely that the bolt securing the linkage had not been sufficiently tightened and secured with the cotter pin during the installation. Next, we're gonna take a look at a Bonanza surprise in Arizona. Um, flight instructor, this occurred in 2016, a flight instructor was asked to complete a maintenance test flight of a beach bonanza following the, following the installation of a repaired carburetor. He elected to use the flight to provide instruction to another pilot who had requested a checkout in the airplane. The pilot reported that the flight was initially normal, but then the engine stopped responding to throttle control. According to the check pilot, the engine remained at idle power as the airplane descended and impacted trees in the residential area. Examining the wreckage revealed that the carburetor throttle cable was detached, as is indicated right here. The bolt and castanite used to secure the throttle cable to the linkage were found lined separately in the engine column. Here they are. There was no evidence that a cotter pin had been used to secure the nut on the bolt as required. It's likely that the loss of engine power resulted from the failure of the mechanic who installed the carburetor to install, or he failed to install the cotter pin on that attachment point. During the maintenance test flight, the castellator nut backed off the bolt, which resulted in the loss of throttle car. Um, this accident was fatal for the pilot and seriously injured the passenger. So you got a couple of things going on there. Um, it was a maintenance flight, maintenance test flight, it really wasn't the best decision for him to bring another pilot along with him, even though it was, you know, on a maintenance test flight, it should, it's not prudent to, to make a decision like that. So um, next we're going to look back at a local accident. And uh, Steve, you're going to jump in here and help us out with this. This is an inter interesting one. Yeah, th this is one that we dealt with. And again, it's to show that, what we're talking about here to assure yourself that your aircraft is in a safe condition to operate, the things you might want to look at, think about, and everything. This is actually an experimental amateur-built aircraft that had an accident. Pilot was very lucky. It occurred as they were flaring to land, uh, so it just resulted in a very hard landing that led it to being classified as an accident. But this shows you how maybe some things in design of experimental aircraft um, may not quite meet the standards of a standard airworthiness certificate aircraft, or if you're operating the um, first version of the aircraft, you may 
you really want to make sure even if it's experimental amateur built that you have good communications with skilled maintenance people and the designer kit supplier of the aircraft this aircraft like i told you how it was destroyed but it actually was someone who is an amp mechanic ia and also a designated airworthiness representative was the pilot of this aircraft and the owner of it and this is what the end result of it was if we take a look at the next picture this is back on the elevator and the elevator became disconnected as the pilot was flaring to land and you'll notice is there are some connections that are appropriate but connecting to the push rod to the elevator on this aircraft is just that turnbuckle screw with a regular nut and it only was in about two or three turns that's the uh, largest amount of connection that it had the owner operator had just performed a condition inspection an annual condition inspection required for experimental aircraft on this also too when this did occur is something like appropriate safetying of this through safety wire or something else Although it would have surprised the pilot, it probably could have avoided this entire accident. And I, I do know the manufacturer of the kits of this has changed this design uh, partly as a result of this accident and some others. But why it's so important to make sure that you have the appropriate safety where it needs to be and also that the connectors look appropriate, are correct in how they are. And the NTSB determined the following for the um, final report. I'm, um, I'm clipping, but it's not responding. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe just try moving your laser pointer back onto the screen and then click. I know that sometimes has an impact. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Excellent. Is the NTSB determined that, you know, the probable cause to this accident was the airplane builder's failure to properly secure the stabilator trim tab push pull tubes connection, which resulted in the tube separation and subsequent hard landing, which we saw the results of. Contributing to the accident was the pilot owner's failure to detect the improperly secured connection during a recent connect or uh, recent condition inspection. You know, and this just goes to prove nobody wants this to happen, but we do end up sometimes having accidents as a result of maintenance. Uh, or improper maintenance being done on the aircraft. Uh, nobody wants it to happen, but it does happen from time to time. You know, and what this brings up, if you go back to what we're talking about, we wanted to introduce you some to some preventive maintenance tonight, which we'll talk about here in a moment. But the important thing is every now and then you want to do that big extended pre-flight on your aircraft you always want to do a good pre-flight but you want to get to know your aircraft take the opportunity to do like an owner assisted annual if you can to learn your aircraft you know maybe in the good weather or classically as we've all been dealing with this covid 19 if your airplane sitting in the hangar is the time to sit down go through it with a good flashlight, whatever it may be, and really look at things in detail to it. Maybe you have a friend or a few friends that know the aircraft or type of aircraft well can help you out. You do an annual cleaning on it, you'll get to learn so much about your aircraft. And last but not least, you know, if you want to learn more about it in a broad-based sense, is if you go to places like Sun and Fun and Oshkosh and everything else, take advantage of the pre-flight um, contest that they may have. Believe it or not, you definitely will learn something there. Now, this is talking about preventive maintenance. I'm gonna launch a poll question for us, and this will just help us learn a little bit more about you. We have um, about 200 people on here. What I'd like to do is, if you would, is get a little bit of an understanding about our audience that we've had out there tonight and see what what we do have and about 200 of you we're through 30 percent of you have voted right now we're getting a lot of it and it, it's some good impact with it and the question again, right. steve, steve was those that uh 
perform preventive preventive maintenance themselves? Yeah. Do you yes. do you perform preventive maintenance on your aircraft? And it's gotcha. yes, no, or for those that don't know what it is, what is preventive maintenance? And then I know there's those experimental amateur built home builders out there, so I also uh, put that in there because experimental types are probably going all the way over are going uh, above and beyond what we're talking about tonight. I'm going to sure. close this out and I will share that. I do have the ability to see it, but boy, we got quite a few. About 62% of you out there are doing preventive maintenance, which is absolutely awesome. A few of you have built uh, your aircraft, which is terrific also. A couple of you are kind of like, what is preventive maintenance? And that's the type of thing you probably want to get together with your instructor because it is one of those private pilot privileges that you have available out there. <laughs> All right. So we'll go back to the screen and, you know, all this safety that we're talking about, the fifth item in that list of what is preventive maintenance, and this is from Appendix A of FAR Part 43, is replacing defective safety wiring or cotter keys. If you own and operate your own aircraft and you have a private pilot certificate or higher, um, you know, you can end up doing that and you need to follow the proper procedures associated with it. You know, our, our friend Tim has done multiple webinars and events associated on preventive maintenance and doing it right. So I would encourage you to look at what we have available on the FAST team on that in the future and also historically. We, and what I'm getting at, you know, this is the joke between Rob and I, <laughs> you know, Rob, I, and Tim, is, you know, they truly are the maintenance types. I'm a bit more, you know, the pilot types. And it's like, you know, as we talk about this maintenance stuff, you know, there are things. I thought that was there yesterday, right? And I'm there. I'm the guy sometimes sitting there scratching my head saying, I don't even know what I'm looking at. And that's the case for a lot of us in the pilot world, you know, and as a result, we encourage you to get to know your aircraft. We want you to know your aircraft. We want you to do preventive maintenance right. And that's the whole aspect to it. If you move to the next slide, we've talked about safety wiring and what is associated there. But you, if you're going to be doing this preventive maintenance, you want to make sure that you are doing it right. For the experimental types, the EAA has terrific forums and videos, and if you're members of an EAA chapter or two like I am, those are great places. There's people that really know what they're doing. Usually they hold, <laughs> you know, IA certificate and everything else too. Uh, you know, as Dan has done in the past, the owner-assisted maintenance and annual. There's even a few online courses that can help you out. I, I know I listened to Dean Showalter's podcast on owner assisted maintenance and he has um, a little course that he has that's video based but on safety wiring and has multiple little tips and tricks associated with it you know we just want you to know how to do it right that's the big thing that we're trying to get out to you is look at your aircraft know your aircraft look for these safety features on it and if you're gonna fix it yourself on an aircraft that you own and operate as part of preventive maintenance, make sure that you're doing it right. Hey Steve, let me add one thing to that. I think, yeah. you know, as a owner doing preventative maintenance on their aircraft, sometimes they don't know what they don't know. And that's one reason that we've been doing some of these uh, preventative maintenance webinars here lately. We've done, probably two or three of those. I just done one for an EAA chapter and it's to make the pilots aware that some of this stuff is done a particular way for a reason and where to find that information. I know y'all have talked about AC 4313. You have it down in the handouts where somebody can download it. You can also go to fa.gov and download both 1B and 2B for free right now. So, you know, go on FAA.gov, download both of those manuals, and there's a lot of good, useful information in there, especially if you're an owner wanting to do preventative maintenance on your airplane. Thank you, Tim. Um, 
that that about wraps it up. We're we're going to open it now for questions. Um, and uh, uh, John, I think um, you were the one who was going to manage the questions for us. Did you have any 